Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to St Luke's Church, our Sunday morning service. It's good to have you with us whenever you are watching this. You're very, very welcome. So we're going to begin our service with a lovely song from Ricky that I hope you can all join in with, certainly in the chorus, um, As the Deer Pants for the Waters. As the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you. You alone are my heart's desire, I long to worship you. Son and of the Holy Spirit. Grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Let's prepare our hearts for worship this morning. We pray together, Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. We come to a time of confession. And I'm hoping that our sermon today will um, bring new life, if you like, to our time of saying sorry, of repentance to God. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins, to be our advocate in heaven, and to bring us to eternal life. So let us all confess our sins in penitence and faith, firmly resolved to keep God's commandments and to live in love and peace with all. And so we pray together. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. And we're truly sorry and repent of all our sins for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us. Forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We say the Gloria. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. 
Lord God, Heavenly King, Almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks. Lord, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You're seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Now we pray our collect prayer for today. The collect for, for the second Sunday after Trinity. Faithful Creator, whose mercy never fails, deepen our faithfulness to you and to your living word, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. So let's... Um, Take a moment now to really listen to our readings. And um, the readings themselves are on our website, on the St Luke's website. And I would encourage you to um, have a look at them too, especially if you want to do that, maybe pause the video, but especially if you want to do that um, before the sermon so that you can have that Romans reading, the, the reading that, um, that Sarah's going to read to us just now. Maybe have that in print as well before you. But let's hear Sarah read it to us. The New Testament reading is written in Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 6, beginning at the first verse. Should we continue in sin in order that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin go on living in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptised into Christ Jesus were baptised into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be destroyed and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. For whoever has died is freed from sin. But if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Alleluia, alleluia. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. You have the words of eternal life. The Lord be with you. Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. A disciple is not above the teacher, nor a slave above the master. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher and the slave like the master. If they have called the master of their house Beelzebub, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear of them. For nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and 
nothing secret that would not become known. What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. And even the hairs on your head are all counted. So do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. Everyone, therefore, who acknowledges me before others, I also will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I will also deny before my Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And one's foes will be members of one's own household. Whoever loves the father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it. And those who lose their, lose their life for my sake will find it. This is the Gospel of the Lord. So let's pray as we begin to look at God's word together. Father God, thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for the Apostle Paul, who brings such insight into the truths and the promises that you give to us. Lord, help us to have strength and courage to hold on to those promises, for us to allow them to give us hope. Amen. Amen. Well, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin in order that grace may abound? It's quite an attractive idea, I think, and it's actually the Apostle Paul's fault that some people actually believe that because Jesus died to forgive us our sins, then let's carry on sinning. Because if we believe in Jesus, then he's going to forgive us. It was in Romans 5, actually, where Paul brought up the idea that where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. So in other words, the greater the sin, the greater the grace we're going to receive. But now in his words to the Roman church that we heard today, in our first reading, in Sarah's reading, we hear that he's now wondering if some people might just have taken that to mean that it doesn't matter if we live a life of sin. Because God is always going to overcome big sin with bigger grace. In fact, this is an issue that people have actually quite often asked me about today. So this morning I'm going to try and tackle it head on, so please bear with me if it gets a little bit intense. Just stay with it, okay? And I hope that it will become clear by the end. Because let's face it, if God loves sinners, then why are we worrying about sin in the first place? If God gives grace to sinners, then let's sin more and get more of God's grace. Our job is to sin. God's job is to forgive us. We'll do our job, God will do his. Well, I'll give you an example of, of, of what I mean. In the early part of the 20th century, the Russian monk, Gregory Rasputin, he taught and lived with this idea of salvation through repeated experiences of sin and repentance. He believed that because those who sin the most require the most forgiveness, then a sinner who continues to sin actually enjoys more of God's grace when he repents for that particular sin at that particular moment than, 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 but than ordinary sinners. So Rasputin lived in notorious sin and he taught that this was the way to salvation. It's rather an extreme example really of, 
the idea of behind Paul's question, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? But it's, it's a good illustration of the issue at hand, isn't it? But even in a less extreme way, the question is still a valid one, I think. If God's salvation and approval are given on the basis of faith, can't we just say, I believe, and then live any way we please? I'm sure you'll have seen preachers almost threatening their, their congregations with the, the dreadful things that are going to happen when you sin. Because their Old Testament theology tells them you can't keep people on the straight and narrow if you tell them that, that, that there's no threat involved here, that, that, that God isn't going to hang over their head and God isn't going to give them some sort of dreadful, dreadful punishment. If they say, they say that if people believe their position in heaven is assured because of what Jesus did on the cross, then that gives them no motivation for living a holy life. Well, certainly not, Paul says. <laughs> for Paul, the idea that anyone might continue in sin so that grace may abound is, is unthinkable. Certainly not. It was quite a strong phrase that he used. It might also be translated, perish the thought, or in more modern day language, no way, Jose. Paul says, when we believe in Jesus for our salvation, our relationship with sin is permanently changed. We've died to sin. Therefore, if we've died to sin, then we should no longer live in it. You can't live in something that you've died to. Paul explains about what exactly he means about being died to sin. But his general point is quite clear. Christians have died to sin, so they should no longer live in it. Before, we were dead in sin. Now, we are dead to sin. And his, his sermon illustration, if you like, is baptism. The idea behind the, the ancient Greek word for baptised is to to be immersed or overwhelmed in something. And the Bible uses this idea of being baptised uh, into something in several ways in the Bible. Different ways. You know, like a, a, when a person is baptised in water, they're immersed, they're covered in water. When they're baptised with the Holy Spirit, they're immersed or covered over with the Holy Spirit. When they're baptised with suffering, that Mark tells us about, they're immersed or that they're, they're covered over with suffering and Paul refers here to being baptized to be being immersed or covered over in Jesus Christ and that's why we baptize with water in our in our baptism services here at St Luke's it's it's an acting out of our immersion if you like uh, our, our, our identification with Jesus in his death and in his resurrection. And Paul takes the idea of going under the water in baptism as a picture of being buried and coming up from the water as a picture of resurrection, of rising from the dead. In this way, baptism is a, baptism is a really important symbol of, of a spiritual reality. But it doesn't make that reality come to pass. If, if someone is, has spiritually died and, and risen with Jesus, if someone hasn't done that, if someone hasn't inside themselves, if that spirituality has not died and risen again with Jesus, all the baptisms in the world are not going to make any difference. Paul says something life-changing happens when someone believes in Jesus Christ as their saviour. You can't die and rise again without it changing your life. So verse 5 onwards in our Romans reading, it, it explains it. And, and this is why I'd quite like you to read it as well as, as well as hear it. For if we've been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, 
and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. For whoever has died is free from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, our reading says, we believe that we shall also live with him. We know that Christ, having been raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. You see, we are united with Jesus Christ. There, there can't be a closer union. The, the phrase for, for that union used here expresses the process by which a branch is, is grafted to a tree. And so the life of Jesus flows through us as the life of a tree will flow through a branch. And it's like the picture that John gives us in chapter 15 of how we are to abide in him. We are to rest in him so that he can flow through us. And that's how close we are with Jesus when he becomes our saviour, when we acknowledge him as our saviour. And this close union is in both his death and his resurrection. I, I don't know about you, I'd imagine that most of us are are quite happy to be united together with Jesus in his resurrection, in the glory of his resurrection. Perhaps not quite so much that we might, be, we might not be willing to be that closely united with him in his death. But you see, you can't have resurrection without death. Without death. You can't, you can't have one without the other. Our old self was crucified with Jesus and it happens spiritually when we identify with Jesus' death, when we recognise that our salvation, our forgiveness, our eternal life is claimed, is, is, is ours through what Jesus did on the cross. The crucifixion of our old self is something that God does in us. And in place of the old self, the self that, that doesn't worry about others, the self that doesn't love God with all our hearts, God gives us a new self, a self that's instinctively obedient and pleasing to God. And this new self is that which was raised with Christ in his resurrection. And this happens to free us from the hold of sin, the old sinful self crucified. There's no, there's no battle really. Our flesh is weak and, and it certainly is the devil who tries to tempt and influence towards sin. But our will, our self, wills against it, our soul. Our slavery to sin can only be broken by death. In the, in the, there's a 1960 film Spartacus, I don't know if you remember it, Kirk Douglas played the escaped Spartacus and he led a brief but, but quite a big rebellion in ancient Rome. And at one point in the film Spartacus says, death is the only freedom a slave knows and that's why he's not afraid of it. We are set free from our sin because the old self has died with Jesus on the cross and now we have a new self, a free self that lives. And our new self not only has life, but it has eternal life. Death no longer holds any fear for us. We've been free from that because Jesus rose from the dead. But this new life we've been granted isn't so we can live according to ourselves. We live to God. We're, we're free to live to please God. You know, the 11th of the original 42 articles of the Church of England states this truth with a, a, a real beauty, I guess, that, that 16th century English expresses very well. It says, the grace of Christ or the Holy Ghost by him given, doth take away the stony heart and given an heart of flesh. God takes away our rock-like heart 
and gives us a soft heart of flesh. We who believe that Jesus is the Son of God are truly set free. But I wonder if you actually feel you're set free. You know, if someone's lived in prison for, for many years and then set free, they often think and act like they're still in prison. They're still a prisoner. The habits of freedom haven't been ingrained in their life yet. I just want to read you this story. Um, in the 14th century, two brothers fought for the right to rule over a dukedom in what is now called Belgium. And the elder brother's name was Reynold, but he was commonly called Crassus. It's a Latin nickname, meaning fat, because he was very horribly obese. And after a heated battle, Reynold's younger brother, Edward, led a successful revolt against him and assumed the title of Duke over his lands. But instead of killing Reynold, Edward devised a curious imprisonment. He had a room in the, in the castle built around Crassius, Edward, a room with only one door. But the door wasn't locked and the windows weren't barred. And Edward promised Reynold that he could regain his land and his title any time that he wanted to. All he had to do is leave the room. The obstacle to freedom was not in the doors or the windows, but with Reynold himself. Reynold, being grossly overweight, he couldn't fit through the door, even though it was a, a nearly normal size. All Reynold had to do was to diet, diet down to a smaller size and then walk out a free man with all he had before his fall. However, his younger brother kept sending him an assortment of really tasty foods and Reynold's desire to be free never won out over his desire to eat. Some would accuse Duke Edward of being cruel to his older brother. But he would simply reply, my brother is not a prisoner. He may leave when he so wills. But Reynold stayed in that room for 10 years until Edward himself was killed in battle. It, it really illustrates, this story really illustrates the experience of many Christians. Jesus set them free. Jesus set them free forever. So that, so that they may walk in that freedom from sin whenever they choose. But since they keep yielding, if you like, their, their bodily appetites to the service of sin, they live a life of defeat, of, of, of discouragement and imprisonment. Does anger have dominion over you? Does Gossiping and complaining, does covetousness have dominion over you? Does pride, does laziness have dominion over you? We've given a promise of victory. It doesn't say sin will not be present in us, because that will only be fulfilled when we are resurrected in glory. But it does promise that sin will not have dominion over us because of that work, that great work that Jesus did in us when we claimed him, when we claimed him ourselves as the Son of God. God hasn't condemned you under the dominion of sin. He set you free in Jesus. And this is encouragement for all, for everyone, because we all struggle with sin. It doesn't work in a legalistic, performance-orientated Christian life. It will happen as we live not under the law, but under grace. And, and this was quite hard for the Jewish people in, in Paul's day, because life under the law was everything. The law was the way to God's approval, the way to eternal life. And Paul says that in the light of the new covenant, we're not under the law, we're under grace. Jesus' work in our life 
has changed everything. So why don't we just continue in habitual sin and so that grace may abound? Because when we're saved, when our sins are forgiven and God's grace is extended to us, we're radically changed. The old self has died and the new self lives. The changes might not come all at once and they may not come to every area of one's life all at the same time, but they will be there and they will be real and they will be increasing as time goes on. We are set free from sin and that means we no longer have to sin. Sin is inevitable. Sin is inevitable. But it isn't because God has designed a system by which we must sin. 1 John makes this clear. He says, if we have no sin, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Yet we know that in the power of Jesus we can each resist the next temptation. And that's what Jesus wants us to be concerned with. You know, it's like, can you imagine it? You get a new job. On the first day of your new job, you leave work at lunchtime and you go to your old job and you ask your old boss what he wants you to do. It just doesn't make sense. Are you living a life like Reynold? Keeping yourself from enjoying the freedom that God wants you to live in. The door is open for you to walk out of. And as children of God, we can reach up, we can take the hand of God our Father and allow him to lead us out of that room and into the freedom that Jesus has bought for us. We might run back into that familiar room and God will keep leading us out. His grace will abound and we will come to know but it doesn't make sense to go back into that room. It doesn't make sense to continue to sin. Going forward into freedom in the power of Jesus really does. Let's pray. Lord, as we consider just, Lord, just how, how powerful our our faith in Jesus is. How gracious you are. We ask, Lord, that all of us will find encouragement in your message of freedom from sin. Lord, help us all to choose freedom, not slavery. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let's affirm our faith in Jesus. Because we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, and through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures, and he ascended into heaven, and he's seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, 
who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. So let us pray. Let us pray. Father God, in our imperfection we come before you knowing that you will answer our prayers this morning. We begin by thanking you for sending your Son Jesus Christ to live, die and rise again so that we might be forgiven, so that we might live in freedom from sin and so that we can have eternal life with you in heaven. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all those who don't know you. We pray for those who are locked into ways of working and living that are selfish and destructive. May we be people who are not afraid to talk of you, so that we may in all enjoy the freedom to live in love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, the coronavirus has meant that there will be changes ahead for us all, and we are not sure of the permanent effects it will have on our lives. Rather than live in fear, help us to understand that your love and protections mean that we can face the future with confidence and hope. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all those who have already been affected by the virus, for healing and a feeling of wholeness to return. We pray for those who care for the sick and thank you for the selfless dedication in doing so. Give our government wisdom to fund and support our NHS wisely and well. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the Black Lives Matter movement. May all who work for racial justice and equality raise their voices higher than those who use a tragic incident in America as an excuse for violence. Lord, as we feel unsettled and saddened, may we also understand the part we each have to play in making our world a better place, a more loving place. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the work of our schools, especially those in our area where staff and pupils are learning how to teach and learn in socially distanced environment. Keep them safe, Lord. Surround them with your grace and compassion as they strive to continue with the education of our children. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As we thank you for all you have who have returned to work, who never stopped working, all who put themselves at risk for the sake of others, all who volunteered for charities such as the food bank, all who bring peace and joy to our neighbourhood, above all, we thank you for Father God, for being ready to extend your hand of love to all your creation. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now as we come to share bread and wine, before we do so, let's make sure we offer one another a sign of the peace, because we are the body of Christ. In the one spirit we were all baptised into one body. So let us then renew all that makes for peace and builds up our common life. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Let's share a sign of the peace with one another. Peace be with you. 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 I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice. 
to the Lord. And let's give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. Father, we give you thanks and praise through your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, your living Word, through whom you have created all things, who was sent by you in your great goodness to be our Saviour. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he took flesh as your Son, born of the Blessed Virgin, he lived on earth and went about among us. He opened wide his arms for us on the cross. He put an end to death by dying for us. And he revealed the resurrection by rising to new life. And so he fulfilled your will and won for you a holy people. And therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Lord, you are holy indeed. The source of all holiness. Grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit and according to your holy will, these gifts of bread and wine may be to us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, who in the same night that he was betrayed, he took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. And he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. And so, Father, calling to mind his death on the cross, his perfect sacrifice made once for the sins of the whole world, rejoicing in his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension and looking for his coming in glory, we celebrate this memorial of our redemption. And as we offer you this, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, we bring before you this bread and this cup. And we thank you for counting us worthy to stand in your presence and serve you. Send the Holy Spirit on your people and gather into one in your kingdom all who share this one bread and one cup, so that we in the company of St. Luke and all the saints may praise and glorify you forever. 
through Jesus Christ, our Lord, by whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory be yours, almighty Father, for ever and ever. Amen. And now as our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. And on your behalf, as we pray, draw near with faith, I will receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, and his blood which he shed for you. As I eat and drink, we will all remember that he died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith and with thanksgiving. So I say, the body of Christ was broken for you. And the blood of Christ was shed for you. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. notices well we are still working towards our church to be open for private prayer on the last Sunday in June I think it's the 28th that's what we're working towards between 10 o'clock and 12 o'clock so it'd be lovely if you can come um, it's not a service we're not inviting you to a service we're inviting you into the church where you can come and sit socially distanced and pray for your own personal prayer. The Lord be with you. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen.